All right. I have been burned too many times by Zoom in recent uh, <laughs> in recent uh, days trying to record videos that I have uh, switched to a different software that uh, hopefully doesn't kick me off of the meeting while I'm trying to record a, a video lecture. Anyway, uh, not that you really needed to know that, but this is like the third time I've tried to record this lecture. So it's, <laughs> so it's a little bit frustrating. Anyway, uh, 3.7 is about trigonometric identities. Uh, you should have seen several of these at this point in your mathematical career, whether you had a formal trig class or you just took like integrated math or whatever. Uh, you, you should have seen several of these identities at this point, and you should have seen derivations of, uh, derivations of these identities. So I, I'm not going to derive any of these for you at this point. However, part of the purpose of this section is to uh, review how to verify trig identities, and so we'll be uh, verifying not, not the ident identities listed on this page, but other identities that we can sort of uh, derive based on these ones. So. Um, for the purposes of this class, I guess, if you've never seen these identities before, then I, I guess that I am sort of uh, asking, you to, to, asking you to suspend your disbelief and just take it for granted that these things are true. Um, if you're interested in seeing proofs of any of these and you haven't seen them in a previous trig class or something, then you can look up videos on uh, YouTube or something that will verify these identities for you. Uh, but we just don't have time to go through each one of these things and verify them all. Uh, in a previous attempt to uh, to record this uh, lecture, I went through and I started putting check marks next to the identities that I thought were particularly important and ones that you should pretty much have memorized. Uh, I mean, some of these things, like the co-function identities, the periodic identities, the even-odd identities, these are all things that um, should be pretty intuitive, right? Um, the periodic identities we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about graphing trig functions in 3.8, but it, it should be pretty pretty clear. I mean, uh, sine theta plus 2 pi is the same as sine theta, or if you prefer to work with degrees, you could say sine theta plus 360 is the same as sine theta, right? And so on and so forth. Uh, same way with co-function identities, even odd identities, they're, they're pretty um, uh, intuitive, I think. The reciprocal identities, you should have these things memorized for sure. They're going to come up a lot. You should be very comfortable switching, uh, you know, basically you should be really comfortable rewriting all trig functions in terms of sine and cosine. So so that that sort of takes the tangent and cotangent identities into account as well. Um, we also have the Pythagorean identities that you should have memorized. Um, these are called Pythagorean identities because they come from the Pythagorean theorem, right? If you take the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and then you take turns dividing through by different things, you get each one of these three identities, right? And so, so you get sine squared plus cosine, cosine squared equals 1 by, the, by, by dividing through by r squared, right? So if you take x squared plus y squared equals r squared and divide through by r squared, um, then you're going to get, well, really what you're going to get is cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. But same same difference, right? Um, and same way with the other two. Um, double angle identities, uh, sine 2 theta equals 2 sine theta cosine theta, that one comes up a lot. Uh, the other ones don't come up quite as much in my experience, but that doesn't mean that they won't ever come up. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's not necessarily important for you to memorize those. Half angle identities, those things will come up, but, but the way that they're going to come up is, is not so much in terms of half-angle identities. And when I say that they'll come up, what I mean is in calculus, right? So in calculus, these things, they don't really come up as much as the power-reducing identities, which are really the same thing if you squint at it just right. In other words, if I take this and I, and I solve for sine theta, so I take the square root, then I'm going to get sine theta equals plus or minus 1 minus cosine 2 theta over 2. And now if instead of thinking of it as sine theta, I think of it as sine, you know, alpha over 2 or something like that, then here I would have cosine 2 times alpha over 2, which would just be alpha, right? And that's where you get the half angle identities. So uh, power reducing identities are really the same thing as half angle identities. And um, these things come up very, very commonly in calculus. Um, and you'll see why, but but these would be good ones to memorize as well. 
law of sines and law of cosines we saw in the previous section. These other three things, sum and difference identities, product sum identities, sum to product identities, they don't come up very much in calculus at all. But, um, but that doesn't mean that they couldn't. It doesn't mean that your instructor couldn't you know, invent a problem that requires you to know a product to sum identity or something like that. So, um, so all of these things could come up. Um, for, for the purposes of this class online, it's like, uh, obviously, I have no way of controlling whether or not you're going to look at this list of identities. So, so of course, you're welcome to use this, this sheet uh, to, to do any and all problems in this class. That said, you'll be well served uh, in your calculus classes if you know some of these things by heart. So just just definitely go through and, and memorize the ones that I've checked here. Uh, if you could memorize all of them, that would be even better. Um, but let's go ahead. I printed off a new second page because I filled out the second page in a previous attempt to record this video. Uh, but, but anyway, so... Um, a couple things that I want to do in this section is, first of all, uh, just practice applying the identities that we saw on page one. And then second of all, um, I want to practice uh, verifying other trig identities. Okay, so, um, so let's get to it. So first of all, just uh, practicing applying the trig identities that we saw on page one. Let's do some of these problems. It says, suppose that sine theta is 3 fifths and that theta is in quadrant 2. And let's calculate sine 2 theta. So one thing that you might think that is wrong is that you might think, well, if sine theta is 3 fifths, then sine 2 theta should be 2 times that, right? It should be 6 fifths. Uh, but that's not correct. Uh, for one thing, the sine function, the, the largest the sine function can ever get is 1. And 6 fifths is more than 1. So, so right off the bat, you know that that can't be right. Um, but for another thing, doubling the argument does not necessarily double the output. Uh, sine 2 theta could be a very different value from sine theta. So how do we go about this? Well, one way that we could tackle this problem would be to use the identity sine 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. And sine theta we know is 3 fifths. Cosine theta we don't know, but we could figure it out pretty easily because we know that theta is in quadrant 2. And we know that sine theta is 3 fifths, so that y is 3 and the hypotenuse is 5. Um, so we can solve for this side now. Uh, it, it, so you can use Pythagorean theorem and... Um, and do you know x squared plus y squared equals r squared and then solve for x. If you do that, you're going to get x is plus or minus 4. And we're going to take the negative case, right? Uh, because we're over here in quadrant 2, so x should be negative. So that means that sine 2 theta is 2 times sine theta, 3 fifths, times cosine theta, negative 4 fifths. Okay. And so that comes out to 12 times 2 is 24, negative 24 25ths. And there's sine 2 theta. Okay, let's do another double angle identity, tangent 2 theta. Tangent 2 theta, oh, this one I don't have memorized. So tangent 2 theta is, it looks like 2 tangent theta. Oh, you still can't see it. There you go. 2 tangent theta over 1 minus tangent squared theta. So let's let's do that. So this is 2 tangent theta over 1 minus tangent squared theta. And this shouldn't be too terrible since I've already figured out uh, x, y, and r for theta. Right? This was theta here. It's the same theta. So, uh, so tangent theta is just going to be 3 over negative 4. Or in other words, negative 3 fourths, right? So we plug this thing in, we get 2 times negative 3 fourths over 1 minus negative 3 fourths squared. And then you simplify that mess, right? Uh, I don't know if all the nitty gritty details are all that interesting. Uh, so this would be negative 3 halves over uh, 9 sixteenths. One minus, 1 minus 9 sixteenths would be 7 sixteenths. 
and then you flip and multiply. So we get negative 24 sevenths. Okay. Um, so that's that, right? That's how we use double angle identities. Um, let's see one where we use a half angle identity. It says use a half angle formula to find the exact value of cosine of 157.5 degrees. Okay. Well, so they're telling us to use a half angle identity. So, so I guess first of all, we should figure out 157.5 degrees is half of what angle? Well, so you can just do 157.5 times 2 to figure out. 157.5 times 2 is 315. So 157.5 is half of 315, right? So when I'm thinking of cosine of 157.5 degrees, I'm really thinking of it as cosine of 315 degrees divided by 2. And I have a half angle formula for this, right? The half angle formula is that this is plus or minus square root of 1 plus cosine uh, theta, 315 in this case, all over 2. Now, I have to make a decision of whether or not I'm going to take the positive or the negative uh, square root. And to make that decision, I look at the value I'm trying to calculate, right? I'm trying to calculate cosine of 157.5 degrees. 157.5 degrees is in quadrant 2. That means that cosine is going to be negative, so I should take the negative. I should take the negative square root in this case, right? Um, and then I can also think about what cosine of 315 degrees is. 315 degrees is in quadrant 4, and the reference angle for 315 degrees is 45 degrees. Uh, so cosine 315 is going to be the same thing as cosine 45, right? Cosine 45 is root 2 over 2. So um, this is going to be negative, negative square root of 1, <laughs> 1 plus root 2 over 2 divided by 2. And that's it, right? That's the exact value. We, we can simplify that a little bit, of course. right? So for one thing, we can clear the comp complex fraction inside of here by multiplying by 2 over 2. We're going to get negative square root of 2 plus root 2 over 4. And then we can also apply the radical to the numerator and denominator and take the square root of 4, which would just be 2. So we're going to get uh, negative square root of 2 plus root 2 divided by 2. Right? Uh, and that, I think, is pretty much as simplified as it's going to get. But, but that would be the answer to that one. Okay? Uh, moving on. Let's see if we can do some more stuff. So, so here's another half angle identity that they're, that, uh, they're wanting us to use, I suppose. So they want us to calculate sine theta over 2 if sine theta is negative 5 thirteenths. Um, well, this helps us, but not as much as you might think, I guess. Uh, let, let's see, sine theta over 2, the half angle identity for this is plus or minus square root of 1 minus cosine theta all divided by 2. Let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, 1 minus cosine. Okay, so uh, we need to figure out what cosine theta is and what we're given is sine theta. So so we can draw a little picture, right? We know that theta is between pi and 3 pi over 2, so it's down here in quadrant 3. We know that sine theta is uh, opposite, so negative 5 over hypotenuse, 13. And then we can, we can use Pythagorean theorem to uh, solve for the missing side. Uh, I think it's 12. I think it, so I think we would use a negative 12 in this case, right? Um, but yeah, you would do, you know, uh, x squared plus negative 5 squared equals 13 squared and solve for x. You, eventually you would get x equals plus or minus 12. You're going to take negative 12 since you're in quadrant 3, so x is negative. Okay, so that tells us that cosine theta is negative 12 thirteenths. So, 
The other thing we need to do is figure out what sign to use. If we know that theta is between pi and 3 pi over 2, then that means theta over 2 should be that means theta over 2 should be somewhere between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 4, right? Uh, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, that would put us in quadrant 2. And uh, sine is positive in quadrant 2, so we're going to take the positive square root this time, okay? So this is going to be square root of 1 minus negative uh, 12 thirteenths. over 2. Uh, so that's square root of 1 plus 12 thirteenths. 1 is 13 thirteenths. So 13 thirteenths plus 12 thirteenths would be 25 thirteenths over 2, uh, which would really be square root 25 over 26. We can apply the square root to the numerator and denominator independently and get 5 over root 26. Oh goodness! And then we could uh, it, that would be a that would be a really good answer, of course. But you could you could rationalize that by multiplying by root 26 over root 26 and get 5 root 26 over 26. Either one of these would be fine. Okay, but that's the idea there. So that's how we use half-angle identities. So, so we practiced using double-angle identities, half-angle identities. Um, number four says find tangent theta if sine theta is negative one-fourth and cosine theta is negative, 15, negative root 15 over 2. Well, that's easy, right? Tangent is just sine over cosine. Right? So that's negative one-fourth divided by negative root 15 over 2. Uh, the negatives are going to cancel. We're going to flip and multiply, right? Uh, so the 2 there will cancel 2 and leave a 2. We're going to have 1 over 2 root 15. Or if you like, you can rationalize it and get root 15 over 2 times 15, which would be 30. Okay? Um, so there's that one. Number five is also pretty easy. It says cosine theta is three-fifths. Find secant theta. Well, reciprocal identities, right? Uh, secant is just the reciprocal of cosine. So if cosine is three-fifths, then secant is five-thirds. Right? And that's all there is to that. Um, sum and difference identities. So it says use a sum difference identity to calculate sine of 15 degrees. Okay, so in order to do that, we have to think of, I mean, obviously you could punch this into your calculator, right, and avoid using sum and difference identities altogether. But if we wanted to figure out this value by hand, what we need to do is rewrite this in terms of two angles whose values we know, right? Uh, so there's more than one way to do this. So one possibility is you could use 45 and 30, right? So you could say sine 15 is sine of 45 minus 30, right? Right? Because 45 minus 30 is 15. Um, another way you could do it is to use instead of 45 and 30, you could use 60 and 45, right? 60 minus 45 is also 15. So, uh, so more than one way to do this, but I'm going to stick with what I've written down. So sine 15 is really sine 45 minus 30. Now we're going to use a difference identity. And I don't have this memorized off the top of my head, so let me look. So it's these ones that we're talking about, right? So what I have is a sine alpha minus beta situation. And it turns out that that's equal to sine alpha cosine beta minus cosine alpha sine beta. The plus or minuses here, they go together. So if you have sine alpha plus beta, then you're going to use a plus sign uh, on the other side of the equality. If you have a negative, like we do in this case, we're going to use a minus sign. So it's sine alpha cosine beta minus cosine alpha sine beta. Okay. So this is going to be sine alpha cosine beta minus cosine alpha 
sine beta. Okay, root 2 over 2 times, oh, cosine 30 degrees would be root 3 over 2 minus root 2 over 2 times sine 30 degrees would be 1 half. And then you can simplify that. Root 2 times root 3 is root 6. So we get root 6 over 4 minus root 2 over 4. Or if you like, you can rewrite that as a single fraction. Call it root 6 minus root 2 all over 4. Okay. So there's that one. Uh, let's do cosine 75 degrees. Cosine 75 degrees. So again, using a, uh, a sum or difference identity, um, I can think of cosine 75 degrees as uh, maybe 30 plus 45. So maybe I'm thinking of this as cosine of 45 degrees plus 30 degrees. So I'm going to be using a sum identity for cosine. Let's take a look. So a sum identity for cosine, I have cosine alpha plus beta. I have a alpha, alpha plus beta situation. That's going to be cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta. So again, the signs go together, right? If you have alpha plus beta here, then you need to do a minus sign there. If you have alpha minus beta, then you need to have a plus sign there. But, uh, okay, so cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta. So this is going to be cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta. Um, okay, let's see. So cosine 45, we've done all these already, right? This is root 2 over 2 times root 3 over 2 minus root 2 over 2 times 1 half. And we get the same answer as we got before. That's really interesting. Well, it makes sense though, right? Because uh, 15 and 75 are complementary. And we know that sine and cosine are co-functions. So it's not surprising that we're going to get the same answer. But anyway, here you go. Uh, root 6 over 4 minus root 2 over 4. Or in other words, root 6 minus root 2 all over 4. Um, so that's how we would apply some of the identities that uh, are on the previous page to find actual trig function values. But sometimes we're really just interested in getting one trigonometric expression to look like a different trigonometric expression. This is very useful, especially when you start to do integration in calculus. Um, so we're going to practice verifying trig identities to sort of help us uh, uh, understand how to do that. Here are some suggestions. So if you want to verify a trig identity, uh, maybe start with the more complicated side and try to transform it into the simpler side. Um, but make sure you're staying focused on the final expression as you do so, right? So, you, so you're trying to manipulate one side to look like the other. So look at so so stay focused on the goal and try to take steps that it's that seem like they'll drive you toward that goal. Um, I mean, I, I say this because anything goes, right? You're allowed to do anything legal, right? Anything that's mathematically sound you can do, but some things are going to be more helpful than others. And staying focused on the goal will, will help you to, to know what's going to be effective and what's not. Um, if you're kind of stumped on something, then a good trick is to turn everything into sines and cosines and see what happens. Um, now, here I'm saying start with the more complicated side, but if there are no more complicated sides, like if, if both sides seem equally complicated, then you could try to work on one side for a while and then try to work on the other side for a while in an attempt to meet in the middle somewhere, right? So that's another possibility. And then another trick that often I personally forget about, unless I remind myself, is that you can always multiply by conjugates. And, and I'll, I think I have an example here where multiplying by conjugates is a, a really good thing to do. So, um, so let's take a look at some of these things. 
So looking at uh, part A here, we want to verify that 1 minus sine squared theta, or 1 minus sine squared x over cosine x is equal to cosine x. So I'm going to take my advice here, and um, I'm going to start with the more complicated side, the 1 minus sine squared x over cosine squared, or over cosine x. And the idea with ide uh, our verifying an identity is we're not trying to solve for x, right? So you're not going to like multiply both sides by cosine x or something like that. We're, we're not trying to solve the equation. We're just trying to manipulate this expression to get it to look like that one. And we do this in a series of steps. So one thing that I notice right away is that 1 minus sine squared x is the same thing as cosine squared x. I know this because... Um, I have the Pythagorean identity sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1 memorized, right? I have that memorized. And um, so not only do I have this memorized, but I know that if I subtract sine squared x from both sides of this equation, I'm going to get cosine squared x equals 1 minus sine squared x, right? So I can replace the 1 minus sine squared x here with a cosine squared x. And then cosine squared x divided by cosine x is just going to be cosine x, which is exactly the goal that we were aiming for. So that identity is verified, right? That only took like one step. Well, two steps, I guess. It only took us two steps to get there. So that wasn't terrible at all. So this is kind of a little aside. Let's look at another one. Cosecant theta equals tangent theta over secant theta minus cosine theta. So again, taking my own advice, I'm going to start with the more complicated side. Tangent theta over secant theta minus cosine theta. And I need to manipulate this so that it ends up looking like just cosecant theta. I'm not exactly sure where to start, to be honest with you. Um, one thing that I could try is to multiply by the conjugate down here. So I can multiply by secant theta plus cosine theta in the numerator and in the denominator. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much good that's going to do. Maybe it's something to keep in mind if I get stumped. Uh, but my inclination on this problem, honestly, is to turn everything into sines and cosines just right off the bat and see what I have. So I'm going to change tangent into sine over cosine. And I'm going to change secant into 1 over cosine. And then cosine, of course, is already written in terms of uh, cosine. And what I end up with is this complex fraction, right? So I've got these small fractions within a larger fraction. I can clear that complex fraction by multiplying numerator and denominator by cosine theta. Right? Um, so I do that, the cosine theta is here cancel, leave me with sine theta. In the denominator, if I distribute the cosine theta, in uh, when I distribute it to the first term, the cosine thetas are just going to cancel, leave me with 1. When I distribute it to the second term, I'm going to get cosine squared theta. Oh, there's that 1 minus cosine squared theta again. Actually, last time it was 1 minus sine squared theta, right? But same deal, right? If you take this Pythagorean identity, and you move cosine squared over to the other side, you, then you see that sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared. So I can replace 1 minus cosine squared with sine squared. I have sine theta over sine squared theta. So now I'm really getting somewhere. Now I've simplified this thing quite a bit. Um, one of the sine thetas will cancel. We'll be left with 1 over sine theta. And wouldn't you know it, Another reciprocal identity will get us there, right? 1 over sine theta turns out to be the same thing as cosecant theta. Okay, so there's an example of one where um, you can change everything into sines and cosines, and that works out pretty nicely. Um, let's look at some more. How many more do I have? Just two more. So I'll give you two more examples. Okay. So part C, now, this is one that definitely, it, it's one where neither side looks more simple than the other, okay? Um, but one thing that I will point out is that 
on the left hand side you have two terms in the denominator and one term in the numerator whereas on the right hand side you have exactly the opposite scenario two, two terms in the numerator and only one in the denominator so what this tells me is that to get from here to here will probably require multiplying by the conjugate and this is especially uh, telling because what you have in the denominator over here is the same as what you have in the numerator on the other side except that the sign is different so so this is literally the conjugate of that so that tells me that that that's probably the way to go on this problem um, so let's try that out it, it doesn't really matter what side you start with I'm gonna start with the left hand side and I'm gonna multiply by the conjugate 1 minus cosine theta And let's see what I get. So distributing the sine theta, I get sine, well, maybe I shouldn't, actually. Maybe I shouldn't, you know? I'm just going to leave it sine theta times 1 minus cosine theta for now. Maybe I'll distribute it later. But definitely the no denominator, I want to work this out. I'm going to have 1 minus cosine theta plus cosine theta will cancel. And then minus cosine squared theta. There's that. Pythagorean identity again. Sine theta times 1 minus cosine theta over sine squared theta. And one of the sines will cancel. We have 1 minus cosine theta over sine theta, which is exactly what we were going for, right? So there you go. So that's, that's where multiplying by the conjugate could come in handy. So if the thing you're trying to end up with is almost in some way the opposite of what you're starting with, right, in terms of like how many terms there are in the numerator versus how many terms there are in the denominator, that to me is a pretty clear indication that multiplying by the conjugates is the way to go. Um, okay, one more. Oh man, look at this beast sine 5 theta plus sine 9 theta <laughs> over cosine 5 theta minus cosine 9 theta. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I, I would say that's definitely the more complicated side, so that's, that's where I'm going to start. And... I'm going to go to my formula sheet to see if there's anything that would maybe help me with this. Um, so what I see on the formula sheet that could help are these sum to product identities, potentially. Right? Because I have a in the numerator, I have a sine alpha plus sine beta situation. And in the denominator, I have a cosine alpha plus cosine, or was it minus? I can't remember. I think it was maybe a minus. Yeah, in the denominator, I have a cosine alpha minus cosine beta scenario. Um, but both of those things, it looks like, can be written as a product. And if I play my cards right, look, it looks like uh, some of the product might be able to cancel each other out. So, so I'm definitely thinking a sum to product identity here. So let's see. Sine alpha plus sine beta is 2 sine alpha plus beta over 2 times cosine alpha minus beta over 2. If I can remember that. Let me see. This is going to be 2 sine alpha plus beta over 2 times cosine alpha minus beta over 2. Okay, so there's sine 5 theta plus sine 9 theta. Now let's do cosine 5 theta minus cosine 9 theta. That's this one down here, right? So I'm going to be doing a negative 2 sine alpha plus beta over 2. This is negative 2 sine alpha plus beta over 2 times sine alpha minus beta over 2. Sine alpha 
minus beta over 2. Okay, well, let's simplify this mess. Twos will cancel. <laughs> Uh, the sine 5 theta plus 9 theta over 2's will cancel. What I'm left with is a negative sine and then a cosine 5 theta minus 9 theta. That's negative 4 theta. Uh, negative 4 theta divided by 2 is negative 2 theta. So I'm going to have a cosine negative 2 theta over sine negative 2 theta. Now where is it that I'm trying to end up? I'm trying to end up at cotangent 2 theta. Well, I'm practically there, right? Um, so cosine over sine is cotangent. So what I have now is negative cotangent of negative 2 theta. Now how do I get this to just be cotangent 2 theta? Well, that's where an even odd identity would come into play, right? So looking at the first page, Cotangent of negative theta is the same thing as negative cotangent theta. In other words, I can just take this negative sign and put it out in the front. So if I do that, um, well, first of all, I've got this negative sign that's going to come along for the ride. And then second of, all, I've got, well, second of all, I've got this other negative sign that I can take out now. So I get negative, negative cotangent to theta. And then two negatives will make a positive, right? This is just cotangent. 2 theta. And we've done it, right? Um, so that's that one. Now, we've reached the end of the section. Let me just say this. Uh, verifying trig identities is not easy. It takes practice. Uh, so if you're sitting here watching me like do all this stuff and you're thinking, oh yeah, I can do that, that's easy. When you sit down to work it out for yourself, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Don't get too frustrated. If you start going down the wrong path, that's okay. You, you've got to do something wrong a, a couple times before you figure out the right way to do it. Uh, it, it. Just don't be too concerned about that. Just keep trying. Try try something new uh, if you get stuck. Um, and uh, I think, personally, I think it's a lot of fun. I, I think it's a lot of fun trying to verify trig identities. So anyway, uh, hopefully you can uh, see the silver lining, I guess, and try to have some fun with this section because I, I, I think... I think it can be a lot of fun. But that brings us to the end of trig identities, and we will talk about uh, how to solve, or in the next section, we'll talk about graphing trig functions.